Hey, Anchor Community, Pastor Brian here. Hey, I'm excited to be continuing our teaching series through 1 Peter. It's called Exiles because Peter is convinced that Jesus' followers should feel a little bit what like an exile would feel, that this world is not our home. That's what he continues to repeat. Hey, originally, we we're going to be looking at today, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 22. But honestly, there is so much content packed in that passage that we wouldn't have the time to like adequately go through all of that today. So we're going to be looking at a smaller passage of scripture that I think is the most helpful and relevant for us as we try to figure out what it looks like to be Jesus followers in this moment. But in addition to that, I'm offering some white papers that we've, we've drawn up that go through the passage of scripture that we aren't able to really go into because of the time constraints on uh, this recording. So if you're interested in those white papers, we want to make them available to you. Uh, just fill out the connection card. We'll get them to you. And I think they can be helpful for our study and our pursuit of Jesus. Hey, but we are looking at uh, 1 Peter chapter uh, 3 verses 8 um, to 18 today. And like Peter is convinced that, that we should be living lives of what I'm calling radiant difference. Like when you think about something that radiates, like it's either light or heat. And Peter's saying that your, your lives, Jesus followers, should be lives of, that would radiate light and heat out into a world that is dark and cold. Uh, this is striking to me as I've been thinking about it because I'm thinking about like the impact that we have on people and just by living our lives. Years ago, 2008, um, there was a, an author, maybe you've heard of her, her name is Anne Rice, who came to faith in Jesus. She is known for uh, the Vampire Diaries, the Vampire Chronicles series, so that's right, that CW series that you just binged through in your teenage years. She is the responsible for that. And she's also in the 90s was kind of like connected to the goth scene. Do you remember that? And so it was super interesting in 2008 when she came to faith in Jesus. A lot of people were talking about it, making a big deal of it. She spoke at various churches, in fact, and she described her conversion like this. She said, Americans like to believe we turn to religion because of an accident or the loss of a loved one. But in my case, it was simply the culmination of searching. I wrestled with a lot of theological questions. And then one afternoon, I thought, I love you. I want to come back to you. What a beautiful, beautiful testimony. I remember uh, when I was uh, just a very, very young pastor, just starting out in my pursuit of pastoral ministry, reading about her conversion and being just like kind of, wow, God, this is a vampire, gothic novelist to a follower of Jesus. Uh, and then looking into it more, I felt like kind of this kindred feeling because one of the main like people that she had read while she was or, like, Go, trying to wrestle through her theological questions, as she said, was this New Testament scholar named N.T. Wright. And I remember early in my faith finding him, really stumbling upon him and finding kind of like answers to my heart's questions and my brain's questions when I was in the middle of a spiritual crisis myself. So I remember like feeling like this sense of like, oh, she found him. And I remember how he offered so much insight to me. I, this kind of kindred feeling. But it was interesting, 10 years later, uh, she wrote another note about where she was at with her faith. And she said this in 2018. For those who care, and I understand if you don't, today I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ as always, but not to being a Christian or to being a part of Christianity. It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years, I've tried, I've failed. I'm an outsider. My conscience will allow nothing else. Wow. As a pastor, like this breaks me. Uh, this is what I don't want people to experience. Uh, and I also, I want to talk with uh, Anne Rice. She has since passed away, but I want to talk with her and just say, okay, tell me more. Like, let's think through this. Let's wrestle together. It doesn't have to come to this departure from the faith. 
But the reality is, regardless of my like ache or the questions I'd want to ask her, this is a story that many of us know, right? You probably know. Somebody having this real transformation inside out, come to faith in Jesus only to later be shocked and disillusioned by the hypocrisy inside the church that they thought shouldn't be there and finding themselves with no option but to kind of like step back from the, their faith. Now, it's easy to kind of criticize and be like, well, maybe they didn't have a real faith in the and ask a thousand questions and have a whole bunch of assumptions. But I would just say really little of the, that is helpful because really the lesson that Jesus followers have to learn sometimes in situations like this is this. Our lives matter. What we radiate matters. And the bad news is sometimes when we radiate hypocrisy, we create disillusionment. But the good news is that when we radiate light and heat, God can use that to transform somebody from the inside out. And so while there is negative potential, there is incredible positive potential. And this is what Peter is talking about today. As I mentioned, he's talking about this group of people in modern day Turkey, then Asia Minor, living under intense pressure because of their faith. And he's saying, live radiant lives. Live lives that emit heat and light, warmth, and create visibility. He says in verse 8, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. What Peter's saying there, he's not saying be a doormat and let people wipe their feet on top of you and disregard your own self-interest and your own need for care. He's not saying any of that. What he's saying is you should have a profound internal resolve that is rooted in your, the deep knowledge that you are a recipient of untold riches and the object of unending love. Peter is saying, because you are the recipient of untold riches and the object of unending love, you should have great resolve even in the face of opposition. He goes on quoting a psalm saying, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And verse 13, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Hashtag blessed. Do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. Peter's saying, uh, you know, in this world where you're facing this opposition, when you're facing this pressure, live free. Live knowing that uh, free from any guilt from doing something wrong, but also free knowing that no matter the pressure and the opposition, you have a strength, a resource, a reservoir you're drawing from. It's like he's saying this counterintuitive message of like when somebody says, when somebody curses you, don't retaliate in kind, bless them. He's, he's giving this counterintuitive, countercultural message. It's almost as if he's saying, you know, Jesus followers in Asia Minor, you're play by a different scoreboard and consider different wins. You know, the world has this scoreboard. It's playing according to these rules and it has these wins. And he's saying to these Jesus followers in Asia Minor and to us by extension, you're playing a different game. You have different wins. There's a different scoreboard. And you can imagine this drawing it out a little bit. The wins of the world would be this need for affection, a need for control, and a need for acclaim. Now, it's important to know any therapist or counselor, psychologist would tell you these are actually basic human needs. 
Uh, these aren't unique to the, the world out there. They're, Jesus, they're needs that Jesus followers have as well. The needs for affection, the needs for control, the needs for acclaim. But the interesting thing repeatedly that Peter is arguing all throughout his, his letter is that, is that those needs should be supplied by your spiritual relationship with Jesus as, as you are the object, again, of untold riches, the inheritance that he's giving you, and, and you're the object of his love, and then should be deepened by the community of Jesus followers that you are walking with so that when, when, when you do encounter the opposition out there, you are already filled up to the brim on the real needs you have from your relationship with God and your relationship relationship with the people that you are following Jesus with. So when you encounter opposition there, you're not living from a deficit, but you're living from a deep over the brim reservoir. This is Peter's continual refrain. So he says that you could argue that for Peter, the scoreboard is not how can I get these basic needs of control, acclaim, and affection, but rather the scoreboard could look like this. Am I growing in the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit? Like when I look at my life, do I see marks of the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Do I see those as evidenced in my life, not just as virtues I've worked really hard for, but evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in me to transform me? Do I see evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit? whether to resist temptation or, or to, to, as I'm praying for someone and, or hearing, uh, growing in my spiritual gifts. Like, do I see evidence of this, the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit? Are people flourishing because of my presence in their lives? Are people flourishing because of my presence in their lives? Like, what if we lived according to that as a win? Like, because of my relationship with someone, are they better? And am I growing in a deep and reverent love for God? Like when those become our wins, when we're not living according to the world's game and playing according to the world's wins, but we're, those are our wins and maybe more that you could add, we live lives of radiant difference. We're not we're not hungering for what the world is hungering for because we have been filled by what God and his community gives us freely. P Peter goes on to talk about how like when we live a life like this, we should expect questions. <laughs> we should expect like, wait, how? What? Tell me more. Don't you see that things aren't going perfectly for you, but still you're smiling, still you have hope. So there's this point, the second point we're calling the confident answer. In verse 15, he says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Just going through that, you know, first he's saying that, that we are to like revere in our heart Christ as Lord, and when we do that, we have we become strong in the face of opposition. And he says, always, like always be prepared. He's assuming when we live lives of radiant difference, people will lean in with profound questions. Like, so he's saying, always be prepared because mark my word, they're coming if you live in this way. If you live according to the kingdom's winds of being filled with the fruit of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit, making, judging your, how, how the effect of your, like looking at, are you making a difference in people's lives as a mark of a win and, and, and like growing in, in reverent love for God? If those are the wins, people will ask questions. Always be prepared. It says to give an answer. That word answer in the Greek is apolo apologia. And it comes from our, it's like our modern day word apologetics is like actually go, is connected to that word. If you're unfamiliar with apologetics, I'm not talking about something you should do to somebody that you, you know, unintentionally or intentionally hurt. I'm not talking about an apol apologizing. But the word apologetics, it means like, basically it's like, how do we give credible answers for people's spiritual questions? It's this field of Christian theology and thinking that is sought to give credible answers to people's honest and searching and spiritual questions. 
So Peter's saying, like, always be prepared to give answers when people lean in with questions. You know, typically, though, it's interesting if we were to be honest, I mean, if I'm just like looking at what apologetics often is, um, it usually circles around either proving God, that God exists, pointing to the backwardness of culture, like how, look how messed up they are there, we know how to do it correctly, or arguing um, against widely accepted science, or, point, or, or, um, or convincing someone that they're sinful. Now, um, there's times where we need to like, be able to, as much as we can, prove as much as we can that God exists because sometimes people have questions about that. And sometimes we need to talk, like convince that sin is an issue and it affects, affects everyone. And we need to create and, cred and offer credible answers to people's questions about that. We need to be able to frankly, prophetically talk about the backwardness of culture. In fact, that's something that I feel that we need to do winsomely, regularly, and then also speak about what the kingdom should look like in contrast to it. And this is really in large part what we're doing throughout First Peter. And sometimes we need to critique science um, that, that may be seen as kind of like normative and accepted, but I think oftentimes we Christians in the past have been too eager to kind of critique science out of a mode of insecurity, like, oh my gosh, if this is true, then what? And rather than being confident that God is and going freely into the world of science and, and believing it. So here's, so apologetics has often drifted into those things too oftenly, I'm saying. What I think apologetics should do more often is simply focus on Jesus. Do you notice that? If we're just proving that God exists, convincing people that they're sinful, pointing to the backwardness of culture and, uh, and arguing against science, we may miss Jesus. He says, be prepared. Peter says, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that you have. He's not saying be prepared to give a better argument in defense of something you believe is true. That is important and vital sometimes. But what he's saying is be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. Peter has already told us in chapter 1, verse 3, that the living hope is Jesus. So, I think instead sometimes of giving logical proofs of God's existence or trying to argue some type of scientific thing, we should just quickly, quickly point to Jesus. I remember this is something I try to, or this is something I try to practice. So when somebody says, you know, oh, you're a Christian, oh, cool, well, you know, I believe in science. I say, oh, yeah, me too. I just happen to believe that in the first century, a rabbi named Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead. And, and well, I believe that has changed everything, like absolutely everything. So somebody says, well, I couldn't be religious. They're just culturally re regressive. I just couldn't be religious. I say, well, I wouldn't say that I am really religious or culturally regressive. I just happen to believe that in the first century, a rabbi named Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead. And well, I, I just, it changed everything, like absolutely everything. Somebody says, I, I couldn't believe in God. I, I just haven't seen anything that's a convincing proof. You know, I would say, well, I, you know, I can understand that. You know, there's lots of mystery surrounding that. I, I just happen to believe that, you know, the, in the first century there was a rabbi named Jesus and he died on a cross and, and, and rose from the dead and I, it changed everything, absolutely everything. In fact, I've, I've told that very thing to people and they look at me kind of strangely because I'm like not trying to instantly defeat their argument. I'm running as quick as I can to the feet of Jesus. Here's the thing is that like only he has the power to save, not your proof uh, the proof of God's existence, <laughs> not, your, uh, not your defeat of some type of scientific claim or your uh, kind of critique of some type of cultural trend. Only Jesus has the power to save. And so when I talk about the resurrection of Jesus with people that are asking profound questions, when I talk about his death on the cross, I'm assuming, yes, that God exists, but I'm trying to focus the conversation around the source of our hope. 
I just wanna offer a couple things that are interesting for, for those of us that are like wanting to be able to offer an answer for the hope that we have, but we feel like maybe we're limited or don't have the resources. There's a couple things that I find compelling that I'll often tell people in conversation. And as, uh, like the ones that I alluded to or just mentioned, um, you know, typically I'll say, you know what, one thing that's interesting in the first century is that a woman's testimony wasn't like accepted in a law court. But when you look at the gospels that talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who are the people there at the, at the tomb? It's women. So it's like, why, if the Christian church like, was, was uh, trying to get off the ground, why would it place women there at the tomb if it knew that women's testimony wasn't accepted in the law court unless they were trying to faithfully tell a story that was actually true and actually happened? What if that was the case? If there's hemming and hawing, I'll go on and say, you know, can you imagine this? The largest movement in the history of the world, starting in the backwaters of the Roman Empire before any electronic technology that would expedite a movement and started by uneducated fishermen that were opposed and their leader was killed violently. Can you imagine the largest movement in the world starting from that starting point? It's almost as if it begs the question that had God's aid involved in the beginning, in the process. If there's hemming and hawing, I'll go on. But the, the 11 disciples, except for Judas, who tragically committed suicide because of his betrayal, the 11 disciples died martyrs' deaths, not recanting, giving the offered the opportunity, hey, all you have to do is recant, and them saying, no, what I saw is true, and I cannot recant what I saw with my own eyes because it was unlike anything this world has seen. When you look at those things, you get a compelling picture the unlikelihood of the largest movement starting from such humble origins. Why would they place women at the tomb unless it was actually true and actually happened? And the fact that 11 of the first 12 disciples died martyrs' deaths, not recanting, but holding fast to their conviction of who Jesus was. And when, when that's clear, you can start walking to what happened at the cross this common thing that we all experience, shame and guilt, pain uh, from our own broken decisions and desires being taken care of by a loving God in the person of a perfect person, Jesus Christ. Always be prepared, Peter says, to offer an answer for the hope that you have. Like, people have searching spiritual questions. They deserve credible answers. But let's not try to give answers that, I don't know, like answer the question, but don't answer the question. Let's run to Jesus and make our responses. Even when the question isn't ultimately about Jesus, let's run to Jesus. Peter goes on and talks about how our answers should be marked not by arrogance and um, assumption, but by gentleness and respect. He says, but do this, when you give your answer, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Let me just say, as is commonly known, that we are, in, we are lacking in the arenas of gentleness and respect in the world at large. Uh, 2016, Microsoft introduced an AI Twitter bot that was sought to kind of like replicate and emulate personalities, um, pe people's personalities um, by just picking up tones and cues and words from Twitter. And within 24 hours, it went from being a kind, generous, curious um, piece of uh, artificial intelligence to a racist and sexist chauvinist Twitter personality, artificial intelligence. 
This is what the world sometimes will do to us. This is what the vitriol of the world will do to us. It will turn us toxic if we let it. Recently, I was on Twitter myself because I'm trying to follow people that are decision makers and thinkers with regards to COVID and our pandemical moment. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn people. And I ducked into, if you're on Twitter, you know, the replies to the post. And I saw this Man, I don't know if I could describe it. It was almost as if it was like some a dog fight and a dumpster fire, it felt like. Oh my gosh, it was the absence of anything but gentleness and respect. Peters is saying gentleness and respect, gentleness and respect. It's not insecurity, uh, but it's gentleness and respect. It's not uh, the absence of confidence, but is the absence of arrogance. It's gentleness and respect. Years ago, I went to Las Vegas. <laughs> the only time I've been to Las Vegas was for a mission trip. And I was working, taking college students there. We were working with an organization. And the organization leader had this, can I just say, weird and possibly dumb idea to carry a cross down the middle of the Vegas Strip to uh, try to get people to ask questions. I, we said no, not interested. Uh, but part of his program was to do uh, street evangelism, which admittedly, like I'm just personally uncomfortable with. I'd like, I'd love having conversations with strangers, but going in with this clear agenda to pass out tracks and to get, you know, to start conversations with some type of agenda. Oh, it rubs me the wrong way. But we were under this authority and I thought, well, maybe this will be a good stretching thing for the college students that I'm with. So we did it. It was awkward. Um, but I remember I had one interaction. There was this couple about my age. It was about 60 degrees and sunny and they had big glasses on. They were sitting down, they had margaritas the size of basketballs in their hands. And we sat down, or I, I sat down with the organization's leader and started talking to them. In fact, actually we didn't sit, sit down, we stood up as they were sitting down. And we just started striking up a conversation. They said uh, that they were in Vegas on a trip because their son was sick and they hadn't had time alone for over a year. And quickly, like a couple things happened. Um, we told them that we were Christians. They said that they were Catholic and not interested in having more of a conversation. But Honestly, before I could really even remember what happened, uh, I was on my knees holding their hands. The margaritas had fallen out or dropped. We were talking. Uh, the wife was wiping tears from her eyes. And it became this real powerful conversation that we talked about God, but we talked about their lives. And they asked questions. And I remember at some point saying, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe there's a hope that is stronger than the world's pain, that lasts through any darkness and opposition. And it's my hope that you experience that. Not because I'm trying to get you to believe something, but because I know your parents that love your kid. And I want that, I want you to know and experience that hope. As the conversation went on, and I mean that it was a conversation, not just me talking, more tears came, uh, more reality and like, honesty and rawness was seen. And honestly, I don't know what happened after that point. But I did walk away with a conviction that our apologetics, our answers need a lot more eye to eye, hand to hand, and a lot, maybe a lot more tears. They need to be centered around the real raw experience of a real living hope, not cold, sterile answers to people's real raw searching questions. 
Anchor, I guess that's what I would encourage for you. For you to offer answers with gentleness and respect. Not a, I'm being a nice Christian, but I'm suffering. I'm experiencing what you're experiencing, and I want you to experience the reservoirs that I've experienced. I want you to feel and know the radiant life that first comes from Jesus and has come into me by the power of the Spirit. And there's warmth and there's light that's available to you. You don't have to live defeated, depleted, limited to what the world's resources offer you. That's the type of apologetics that I think is worth it. And that's what I think that Peter is referring to. Obviously, this doesn't come by our own strength. <laughs> it doesn't matter the quality of home life that you were grown up in. We don't get to be people that are like, don't retaliate or gentle and respectful and always have answered. This is something that the Spirit of God does as he brings the truth of Jesus to bear on our lives. As the Spirit of God works in our life, we live radiant lives. We grow into offering confident answers. And we do so with the qualities and the virtues of Jesus himself, gentleness and respect. So my invitation, more than preparing you to get a whole bunch of answers, to be able to give to your neighbors quickly through text message or whatever, my invitation to you is rather this, to simply be present to the Holy Spirit, to ask him, to fill you fresh again. If you feel like you're living a depleted life, running according to the world's race, playing the world's game according to its winds of acclaim and affection and confidence and control, ask the Spirit of God to fill you. Ask the Spirit of God to fill you to make the truth of the inheritance that is freely offered to you and because of what Jesus has done on our behalf, real to you again. And dive into community. Dive in to the riches of imperfect but community so that you might be filled up with what your real needs are so that you might offer the world a radiant life, confident answers with gentleness and respect.